Yes. Yes. Now, the record is started. If you don't want to be seen on camera, please switch off your camera, which you, I will advise you to do anyway uh, while the speaker is speaking so that we don't consume too much bandwidth. Uh, and this will be lay, later published on the website of ACLE and ACT. Andrea, thanks again. You have the floor. Thank you, Alessio. Thank you, Maria, for organizing this seminar. It's a, it's a big pleasure and an honor. Uh, of course, I've, been, uh, uh, and I've known Alessio and we've uh, shared our friendship for many years. Uh, I know uh, some of the people that are uh, connected. I've had the, the chance to work with them or to teach them in the past. So uh, big hugs to everybody. I hope you had um, um, a, a smooth uh, a period uh, of lockdown or non-lockdown, depending on where you are, where you're based. Um, and um, what, I, uh, what I want to do um, today is to sort of take, take stock a little bit with some of you on the things that we have learned um, over the past uh, uh, two decades of uh, evolution of digital technologies. I will do this in a very, very sketchy way though, uh, because we don't have a lot of time. And what those lessons learned tell us about uh, one of the big challenges that the EU has today, that of uh, trying to um, approach the future strategy for data, the future strategy for uh, uh, digital technologies, in particular artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things, in a way that is uh, um, really capturing uh, the, um, uh, the evolution of those technologies rather than continually chasing the past. That is uh, basically what I'm mostly interested in. And uh, this is a little bit also the process that led me towards uh, um, uh, writing the paper that has been distributed, which is the paper where uh, I try to uh, outline a first architecture of, uh, for, the, um, uh, for the digital single market of the future. It's a paper that I wrote for a book that uh, still uh, uh, is, you know, must be published, or it will be published Many of you know how long does it take for the publishers to publish those books, but so yeah, apparently we'd only be out in December. And um, uh, so I asked uh, uh, the College of Europe, uh, since the book is um, edited by two professors of the Department of Law, Inge Hovaire and uh, Sasha Garben, uh, to give me permission to publish that as a research paper. And this is what um, uh, I have done a few days ago. And then I thought since the paper has had uh, very good feedback from inside the European Commission, where I presented it a few days ago, uh, um, um, I said, okay, maybe, maybe it's uh, useful to distribute this paper and discuss it also in Amsterdam. Um, I will do this in a slightly different way from uh, uh, what I would do with the European Commission. Um, and starting with the starry sky. I will have to rush a little bit through this part, but I think it's important for us because uh, many of you researchers will have gone through this process of understanding um, the evolution of technology in a different way. So I tell you a little bit how I see it, and then uh, we go a little bit more into the topics. Um, for me, um, trying to understand how to draft and craft policies for digital technologies uh, is, is a little bit like watching, you know, staring at the starry sky. Meaning, you know that what you're seeing and what you're observing is not real. And what you're observing is something that happened a long time ago, maybe in a research and development lab in the ca case of technologies. And depending on uh, um, what you see and uh, how luminous, how shiny, uh, are the different stars that you see in the starry sky, you might infer uh, that uh, those things might have happened, uh, you know, not too far away, not too many light years away, and, uh, and that it's much more the distance than the actual size uh, of the star uh, uh, that, uh, that determines uh, how shiny it is. Um, and um, this also means that when you stare at the starry sky, you are basically watching it and you know watching an impossible picture meaning you you're watching a a patchwork of images that come from different moments in time and space and um, it's going to be very complicated for anyone who observes to figure out what is the current state of things because uh, some of these stars will have collapsed maybe into black holes others will were small and have become uh, huge supernovas uh, others have uh, become uh, other types of stars in the evolution and the life cycle of stars. Well, crafting uh, policies for digital technology is, is a little bit like this. Uh, if you observe what's on the market right now, you probably are observing the research and development that has taken place uh, 10, 
10 years ago, eight years ago, six years ago, uh, but you don't know where this technology is leading. So if you're a policymaker or a social scientist wishing to contribute to um, the shaping of policy in this field, uh, you actually have to exercise a lot more foresight. You have to uh, push your imagination a little bit beyond to, to uh, grasp uh, with, the, with the help of those that have domain knowledge where uh, technology might be going now so and where it will land uh, in a few years from now. If you are a European social scientist working on EU issues, that is even more complicated because we know how long does it take to imagine, draft, and implement a policy uh, at the EU level, and rightly so. It's a very complicated uh, multi-level governance framework. And um, since we know that, um, we have to imagine a little bit even further in the future if we want to craft uh, uh, useful policies. Now, the, um, the, the current, um, in, say, feeling and mood in Brussels that I can report here is that uh, the, the European Commission in particular, but EU institutions more generally, have been chasing the past until now, meaning that our policies in, uh, uh, for the digital single market in particular have been reactive rather than proactive, and that have been maybe evidence-based, but not foresight-based. And, uh, and that is a problem because it really um, affects the, the regulatory and policy style that we use. And, and this is one of the key messages that I want to launch here. I mean, my ideas as to where technology is going might well be wrong or uh, uh, incomplete or imperfect. And those ideas you find in the paper. But it is important anyway. I do believe that the uh, attitude of looking at foresight is, uh, is the right one. And um, in this, I'm also reassured by, by the fact that uh, for the first time, the von der Leyen uh, Commission um, has uh, uh, brought together um, uh, it, the portfolios of better regulation without a foresight in the hands of Vice President Marosevkovic. And because I, I, there's a, the intention of bringing in foresight much more into the, the policymaking um, uh, domain. And this is also very important for people like us. We do economic analysis of law. We mix together many social sciences. Foresight has, become, has to become one of our muscles in the future, much more than what we have exercised until now. So in terms of what has happened so far, I will go very quickly through this. So if you want me to go back in the, in the questions and answers, I will, I will do it. And it's something that I've developed uh, uh, in a still unpublished paper, maybe to be published later this year for the OECD that asked me, what are the regulatory challenges of the digital transformation? And so I went back to why we are facing challenges today and what are the really sort of almost immutable uh, features of digital technology and in particular of the of the internet ecosystem that have determined uh, um, the disruptive effect on uh, regulatory uh, practice of of, um, of the emerging uh, uh, market phenomena and non-market phenomena as well to me the real foundations and, and of course we can discuss that, are um, the, the ever evolving and increasing computing capacity, what sometimes is framed as Moore law, Moore's law. Some people say it's over, it's slowing down. Um, I don't spend time here. Uh, I do believe that this is not the case. I think we are still uh, witnessing an exponential increase in computing capacity today. Uh, the end-to-end -end architecture of the internet, the fact that uh, um, every end user could uh, uh, initially mm, relatively freely uh, communicate, upload and dump, download documents, ship and receive, um, the traffic, uh, digital information um, uh, with every other end user is the, uh, is the grounds for uh, um, uh, basically direct network externalities, and the, the, the emerging of platforms and the collaborative economy, but the, the underlying foundational fe feature is the end-to-end -end architecture rather than the platforms for reasons that I'll try to outline later. The modularity, the fact that you have a layered ecosystem and you have system goods that it, uh, in order to, to really be used, uh, have to, uh, you know, the users have to put together uh, different functionalities and different technologies uh, and applications produced by different, uh, uh, in most cases, by different companies, also in what we call open architectures, is another uh, feature of the internet since the very beginning. Also thanks to its open standards. And the digital nature of information coupled with these other uh, three uh, foundations uh, uh, that I've already discussed, determines the possibility of uh, firms to reach scale without mass, which is also something that creates enormous constraints for regulators. So in this um, 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 uh, exercise for the OECD, I've put together uh, 
some ideas on what these foundations combined have led in terms of first wave of evolution of the internet, what we have seen in the past decade, decade and a half, um, uh, which is basically the platformization of the internet. We've seen an enormous amount of data uh, being produced by end users, um, the uh, emergence of um, uh, the so-called attention economy, the emergence of uh, network effects, direct and indirect network effects, and this leading to uh, basically a, a crystallization of market power in the hands of those companies that managed to attract uh, a reasonable share of the, of the attention of the end users, basically. And um, this uh, um, uh, trend towards uh, the centralization uh, of uh, um, attention and the centralization, also the extraction of value in the ecosystem is something that has been uh, you know, widely commented upon um, and also uh, stigmatized to some extent because it leads to a very uneven distribution of value in the internet ecosystem. Now, my claim here is that this is a first wave of evolution, is not something that is there necessarily to stay in the internet economy. And thereby, we have to look at where the internet is going to uh, really uh, understand whether regulators can do something to change this trend if there is something uh, that we um, uh, uh, don't like about it or we consider it to be uh, um, suboptimal about it. Now, of, obviously, uh, this trend has been further accelerated by, um, by the COVID-19 outbreak, <clears throat> because, as you can see from, from the fact that uh, some of the big uh, tech platforms are basically the only companies that have uh, massively increased their turnover uh, due to the acceleration of the transition towards the online economy the mm, uh, migration of a lot of uh, our social and economic activities on the online world. Um, other uh, phenomena, and I'll just list them for now, are that are belonging to this first wave and the combination of these uh, foundational items, in my opinion, are the rise of the collaborative economy, uh, the, the increased use of peer-to-peer -peer platforms, uh, which are chiefly related to the end-to-end -end architecture, and the, and the open architecture of the internet and its modular um, architecture. So the emergence related of specific P2P um, models such as blockchain and distributed ledger technologies, and also the fact that it's very important here to understand the roots of market power and also the direction of technology, that this initial massive production of data and information coming from users has determined a, um, a massive increase of demand for technologies that are data hungry, that can process enormous amounts of information, and then, then uh, uh, re, um, yield uh, possibilities of customizing services for the end users, uh, creating a very granular uh, set of business models. So the age of AI, the age of artificial intelligence as we see today, is largely an age, an age of machine learning. It's largely an age of technologies that are extremely data hungry, and it comes from this first generation of production of data that really required a centralized storage and centralized processing of data. Um, I don't go much further than this. We can discuss this later, but just to complete what I've done for the OECD, uh, this of course produces a number of um, potential uh, uh, trends and constraints that are co different combinations of this foundations and evolutions. I will move uh, very quickly through this because this creates a number of regulatory challenges. I'm happy to share the draft of, uh, of this report that was already presented last year and now um, I don't know if Celine Kaufman that I saw in the list of uh, registered participants is there, but I mean, we, it seems that this, uh, this report will be out uh, anyway in the coming months uh, with, of course, some up updates. Uh, what I really put in the, in the paper that I've distributed as highlights of this uh, combination of uh, foundations, evolution, and regulatory challenges are three main trends. And one is the virtualization of functions, uh, um, be this uh, um, network hardware functions that become virtual, or the transition into a cloud-based world, or if you think uh, tr trends such as um, 3D printing, you know, they, 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 uh, basically the conversion of the free movements of, of uh, goods into largely uh, flows of data that then are converted into products at the local level. Um, uh, the servitization, um, the fact that uh, uh, the digital nature of information and the, uh, um, the possibility of accessing virtually um, products and service, uh, products as a service, think about the cloud, but if you study, for example, agriculture today, you discover that you can use a tractor or a drone as a service, by what we call sometimes uberization of society, 
that leads to a shift towards a much bigger weight of services over goods in the future society and creates concerns and uh, constraints and, uh, and challenges also in particular at the EU level. If you think that in our single market, we do have a framework for um, um, uh, products liability, but we don't have a very clear fr framework for service liability, uh, which creates uh, really challenges and might um, you know, be tackled adequately, uh, hopefully adequately by the forthcoming um, uh, proposal for the Digital Services Act. Uh, but there might be a need for additional work to really create a good chain of responsibility in a, in a situation in which most of the goods become accessible as services. And then, as I said before, the platformization, which is uh, a very strange situation for people like us. And maybe we are the only ones that really understand this, right? The law and economics community. We've studied uh, Williamson. We've studied Ronald Coase. Um, and we studied the market versus the firm, the hierarchies versus uh, the market transactions. Platforms, in my opinion, don't fit easily in any of those baskets, meaning they are not really firms in the sense that some of the key functions of the firm are actually externalized in platforms. Uh, for example, uh, the control of the behavior of employees uh, is typically outsourced to end users. Uh, think about Uber. And, uh, but also they, uh, um, some of the key functions such as the hierarchy and the, and the labor relations are externalized, meaning that you have companies like Uber uh, that move a very big uh, economy um, they uh, bring around people, they uh, deliver today much more than uh, um, uh, riding, uh, sort of much more than, than driving, they're riding these days. Um, but they have something like 20,000 employees and shrinking, um, but they have, for example, 4 million drivers, uh, which means we are talking about a, a, a governance form that really shrinks to the minimum possible, the functions of the firm, and uh, uh, transforms hierarchical relations into market contracts, thereby uh, depriving the market, the, the, sorry, the, the employees in particular, but also the end users in many respects, of the guarantees that they have in the typical interplay between markets and hierarchies. So um, the platformization is having disruptive impacts on, on our regulation. Now, I want to move to a second part of this because this, um, uh, to, putting this together, what I've said so far, I meaning the starry sky, plus what we've seen so far in terms of regulatory challenges, um, requires a change in attitude. Because what we've seen so far is a situation in which we have been chasing technology by looking at what came to the market and then trying to react to it, right? It's just like the, in the famous paradox of motion of Zeno, an ancient Greek philosopher, Achilles trying to reach the tortoise um, by jumping on where the tortoise is, uh, but assuming that the tortoise will have made um, you know, some uh, a few steps by the time Achilles gets there, Achilles will not capture the tortoise, and so he will need to jump again in, uh, at T2 into place A3. But the tortoise will already be in A4 by then. So Zeno, already in ancient times, um, um, already had reached a conclusion, which is of course in a theoretical conclusion, that Achilles will never reach the tortoise. Now, in a situation like the one in which we are today. We are in a situation in which the law is the tortoise and has actually the, uh, the challenge of trying to chase Achilles, which is faster. And this, by definition, is something that is self-defeating uh, from the very beginning. I can give you uh, an example of uh, how I got it wrong, for example. It's a, it's a very good example. I, I get it wrong very often. I'll try to be very quick on this, but I, I like writing fiction stories uh, and uh, sometimes also with uh, a high technological component also to try and use narrative uh, to anticipate what might happen in the future. It's a sort of an individual foresight exercise, if you wish. And a couple of years ago, I started writing the story of a guy named Ben that um, discovers, unfortunately, one day that he only has uh, six months left to live uh, at most, um, is terminally ill. And he's contacted by a company that offers uh, to Ben uh, that, uh, you know, a, a full-fledged free data collection exercise, meaning we will collect everything that you've written or said, everything that you have left on the social media, um, or, and we might interview you maybe on your political opinions or maybe on your preferences or what you would like to do in the future. We'll interview your relatives and we'll interview your friends. So that when you die, we create um, a, um, an avatar um, with, that will look exactly like you, but it will age also. 
uh, just like Alessio and I have been aging together, uh, uh, but although uh, you can see this with me much more than with Alessio, but uh, I mean, you can have an idea of how people normally age. Um, and, um, and you would say, uh, you know, that this company will then start managing uh, what we call a grief bot, hmm? meaning a, someone who has the exact appearance of Ben, but ages over time, if the relatives will want that, and, and is able to give advice and is able to have opinions or is able even to recommend, I don't know, new products. Why would you have recommendations in new products um, from Google or Google's homepage if you can have Google or another company manage Ben and have your father or your husband uh, uh, or your uncle give you those recommendations? So we are ushering an era, that's what I thought, in which there is such a dense layer of information and, and, the, and the power of artificial intelligence is such that we will not be able entirely to recognize the difference between um, someone who's alive and someone who's dead. And I thought I was very smart when I was writing this story. And, um, and I said, okay, that's something that I want to present maybe also to the policymakers because it really leads, and leads us into the world of extended reality. And uh, then I realized that uh, Black Mirror was preparing an episode on this uh, called Be Right Back. And then I also realized that um, uh, at the death of a famous uh, Russian influencer, Roman Mazurenko, his girlfriend had created already not the image of Mazurenko aging, but at least a chatbot that to some extent should represent uh, Mazurenko's, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, beliefs and preferences and attitudes. Um, then I saw something else earlier this year, which is um, um, uh, an excruciating documentary, uh, a South Korean documentary of a mother celebrating the seventh anniversary of her daughter in virtual reality, despite the fact that her daughter had passed away three years before. And, um, and a situation like this is a situation, I mean, if you, if you, are, if you get emotional very easily, don't watch it. Um, because, I mean, I watched it only uh, for, say, for professional reasons. But it's not, it's not a nice scene to see the mother really being extremely confused by what she sees because it is actually almost real. Now, the technique used to do this is called, mm, well, the deep fakes in the, in the normal uh, technique, but the underlying AI technique is the generative adversarial networks. And uh, it's the same technique that we use today, and that, not we, but that is being used today by hackers, for example, to, to package deep fakes like this ones. And... Um, Maybe the ones that are participating will, will let me know at the end of the class who they think is the real Putin. I'm uh, not going to say this now. The other things that we have discussed is that sometimes what you see happening and coming through technology is not exactly what it seems. Meaning we've discovered that in many cases, this is the case of the checkout free stores uh, opened by Amazon. Um, those checkout free stores look entirely automated, but Amazon actually is employing dozens and dozens of people and hidden labor in Madagascar to manually observe and correct what the artificial intelligence gets wrong. Um, and finally, we also realize that the more um, things and people produce information, uh, this can create a world in which uh, the information can be granularly used, uh, but at the same time, uh, information can also be used to control people or to score people. So we are in a situation in which we, we are about to maybe reconsider this thing that we've been told during the first wave of the internet, that data is a new oil, that data is a rich treasure that should be leveraged. Um, and indeed, we know that data will be overabundant in the years to come. What will be scarce is not data, but trust. How do we trust that what we see is, um, um, uh, let's say, faithful to reality or real? Um, how do we trust that no one is manipulating us? Maybe through Ben, our father or uncle or, or husband. Um, how do we know that the data envelope surrounding us is uh, something that we can rely on? That is very important also because in the second wave of internet developments that we are now uh, uh, really starting to see, the one of the internet of things, the amount of data produced will be skyrocketing even more than what has happened over the past years. I was uh, discussing with, um, with a, um, experts from a company called ARM that produces processors, and they gave me a ballpark fi figure of um, one trillion connected devices by 2035, whereas we have less than 10 billion connected devices today. Just to give you an idea, 
of uh, what does it mean to live in a world um, in which there are one trillion connected devices and they all exchange data between themselves. So what do we need in order to craft the policies of the future? Well, the first thing that, that we need is we need foresight. The European Commission is trying to do this. And uh, so I, I acknowledge that. For example, Thierry Breton, the new commissioner, has told us that in the new data strategy, he thinks that one should take into account the fact that while data or 80% of the data have been stored today central, in, in a centralized way in clouds, the needs of the new Internet of Things will require a much more uh, diffuse storage of data, much closer to the devices in what we call um, um, edge computing uh, on the edge cloud systems. So, and this might change, for example, the competitiveness issues, uh, but also the sustainability issues surrounding technology, because uh, if there is a situation in which the um, um, uh, cloud operators that have been dominating the market now are not anymore the only and the, the most prominent uh, um, uh, storage centers for data, uh, then AI will also become much more distributed, not just in the cloud, but it, also become, it will also become embedded AI closer to the devices. And, uh, and this might open new possibilities because the EU is actually much better positioned to capture those markets, the B2B markets or the markets where industrial policy and more distributed architectures uh, require a storage of computing power closer to the device compared to the big centripetal powers that have uh, led uh, four or five cloud operators to dominate the world. So the, de the data strategy of the European Commission and the AI strategy go in that direction by exercising, I would say for the first time, a little bit of foresight, trying to anticipate the starry sky evolution, trying to go get ahead of uh, the tortoise or Achilles, depending on the, on the figure, you know, the two figures that I've shown. So in the second data wave, uh, very quickly, what we have, uh, uh, I mean, what we're discussing, uh, me, myself, as a member of the high-level expert group on AI of the Commission, but what I hear discussing also inside the European Commission is that the EU can actually lead the world on restoring trust in artificial intelligence for the reasons I was outlining before. Um, the EU might try to rebalance competition uh, uh, in the B2C markets, the, the parts that I've described as platformization. The Commission could also compete in the development of AI and related technologies for sustainable development, mostly through B2B and so-called embedded AI. And there is also another rising, very important part, which is the role of government as really a trust enhancer in those, uh, in those new ecosystems. So that is a little bit the map of what the European Commission wants to do in terms of regulation in the, in the years to come. Very quickly, this requires not only foresight-based regulation, but also principles-based regulation. One example of principles is the work of the high-level expert group on AI that has developed these four principles of how AI and related technologies uh, you know, should behave and, uh, and should, uh, the types of principles that they should uh, respect. Um, those principles have been um, uh, elaborated and, and broken down into seven requirements for AI. And uh, I'm currently leading the revision of the ethical guidelines for AI um, in the high-level expert group that will operationalize those principles. Um, regulation also becomes outcomes-based, although it's not clear today that the sustainable development goals are really the north star for policymaking, um, as they were supposed to be only a year ago. Um, but in principle, uh, we are treating technology as a means to an end rather than an, a, an, an end in and of itself. That is extremely important. If you think that um, the European Commission, for example, has set uh, the goal uh, of the high-level expert group on AI at the very beginning of the mandate as to strengthen use competitiveness in artificial intelligence. Now, for me, if I ask myself the question, how can the EU become more competitive in AI, I might want to create a huge market, for example, for robotics in factories. But if I ask myself, how can AI help me achieve sustainable development goal eight, that of uh, uh, securing decent work and economic growth, in particular, the sub goal on full and decent employment for everyone, then the answer I give myself in terms of policy is completely different. So it's important that we keep the outcomes in mind. The other thing that is emerging, for, like with many technologies, is that this framework has to be risk-based meaning not all uh, digital technologies applications uh, create the same risk. And uh, we need to make sure that there is an agile governance mechanism for the classification of risks and for the um, determination of what is a proportionate mitigation strategy whenever 
a digital technology raises a specific risk. That is the basis for the future liability requirements in the AI and Internet of Things age. And we are starting to put together some of these um, initial um, you know, uh, uh, pillars uh, in the work of the high-level expert group on AI and in the forthcoming regulatory uh, initiative on AI that the European Commission has now, has now postponed to first quarter of 2021. And the other thing is, if one wants to really treat digital technologies in this way and create a digital single market in which standards are high, uh, then of course this has to come with a degree of international cooperation because otherwise, or, or protectionism. But um, the situation that we are witnessing now at the global level is a situation in which on AI in particular, uh, either there will be a global partnership that will uh, try to include all countries, including China and Russia, or there will be a fragmentation with uh, so-called like-minded countries going their own way and trying to exclude uh, Russia and China, or we are facing, for the first time in years, a concrete risk of uh, um, split of the internet. So where does this leave us uh, as a final part of my presentation? Um, just to reassure Alessio as well and Maria. Um, this leads, leads us in a situation in which uh, we need to cope with, um, we have uh, had the need already to cope with the first transformation of the internet compared to the way in which uh, engineers were depicting it in the early days. So what we call the OSI, the OC layered representation of the internet. You have a physical layer, you have the traffic rules, the logical layer, you have the applications um, typically running on open standards, you have content, and then of course you have so-called wetware, as we used to call it a while ago, and the end users. We've had a first transformation in which uh, cloud-based platforms have uh, largely derogated the um, fully open and fully neutral architecture of the internet. And, but today we are witnessing a completely different situation, and this is what I imagine in the paper as a landing point. A situation in which connectivity becomes more complicated and more uh, multi-dimensional with uh, different types of connectivity becoming available. Low power as opposed to 4G, 5G, uh, various protocols with different features that could be used for different uses. We have potentially the possibility of creating, rather than a, 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 you know, a set of competing cloud operators, a federated cloud environment, on, uh, just as uh, the GAIA-X model um, that is a Franco-German initiative already uh, incorporating many players. The idea of a federated cloud environment is, is not that of creating the, the cloud operator at the EU level, or at least this is not what I would advocate, this is not what I'm advising the European Commission to do, but rather to create a, a sort of an umbrella um, um, perimeter made of code where only the ones that comply with specific EU principles and regulations as translated into code can actually operate. So it's actually an open space, um, but uh, where admission is uh, subject to conditions. Uh, the conditions are not legal in the traditional way, but they are coded in the sense of Larry Lessig, if you wish, in the sense of uh, the fact that the internet, on the internet and on the future internet, again, it will be code rather than law uh, that will determine what's possible. Below this is the emerging layer of the edge and the internet of things. Above that is a digital verification and authentication layer that the EU has been working on for many years that now finally becomes almost operational. They could become the basis for a lot of the freedoms in the single market, from the freedom of uh, movement of persons to the one of goods and services and, uh, and the free transactions across the single market. There will have to be a, an additional legal and semantic interoperability layer, which is something that the European Commission has been working on, where the equivalence and the translation into code of legal provisions is, is provided. And then there's the data strategy of the Commission, where uh, that is currently being shaped as such. Uh, there is a, a, a departure from the idea that data, when they are created, they, they freely flow, but there's rather an organization of data in a way that puts the data to, to the best possible use, uh, ideally, uh, through um, a skills data space, a, a Green Deal related data space, but most importantly, a data space that enables interoperability and uh, uh, between administration and open governments strategies. On top of this, I imagine in the future, four main pillars uh, where the internet sort of um, uh, look, the internet ecosystem, the digital ecosystem uh, looks slightly different in terms of governance. The sectoral data spaces, uh, the, the data strategy of the commission announces many of them. 
an open internet which functions, um, let's say, as the internet has worked since the very beginning. So the, the, the really the best effort open internet that is now joined by um, digital ledger technologies that uh, operate on uh, largely on the internet protocol. And there will be uh, the traditional digital platforms, uh, the cloud-based one that, of course, will survive mostly in business to consumers market. And there will also be a space increasingly on top of the administration data space for what I call open API, open government strategies that uh, uh, will enable uh, the, you know, the, the digital single market uh, to flourish also in terms of relationship between uh, uh, governments and citizens. Of course, end users are there. Artificial intelligence is not a sector or a layer here. It's, it's really um, uh, entering uh, all these layers. And the same is for uh, attempts to enhance uh, control of the users of a personal data through a variety of potential proposals. There is only two there uh, mentioned, but there are, there are more. And uh, in a situation in which we have to build this complex environment uh, and we have to rely on code for many of the things that we do, uh, but we also have to make sure that uh, end users keep the control over their data. And uh, that is perhaps the single most uh, daunting challenge in the creation of the digital single market. Um, basically, um, just to sum up, I want to go back to the starry sky, but just quote one of the sentences that mostly struck me when I, when I studied at school, when I, was a, when I was a kid and studied philosophy for the first time. Basically, in order to re really be good policymakers, we need to do what Kant imagined, Immanuel Kant imagined in the critique of practical reason as the things that really uh, inspired him and um, um, filled the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The starry heavens above us and, and the moral law inside of us. So the principles that we need to embed in the technology and the ability to exercise foresight by looking in, in, a, in an intelligent way at the starry sky. Because above all, the two things that distinguish human beings from machines and digital technologies will, in my opinion, continue to remain always the same too. The ability to um, distinguish reality from its representation Machines require a representation of reality. Uh, and of course, the ability of developing our own understanding of the starry sky and, uh, uh, and our ability to uh, also develop emotions when we stare at the starry sky. So I'll stop there and um, uh, I'll see whether uh, you fainted or you have questions and maybe I'll stop sharing my screen, but uh, I'll still happy to get back to, um, uh, to, to the slides in case there is someone who wants me to go back to some of the slides. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Andrea, uh, for this enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure this, this is gonna prompt uh, a number of questions. We, we, we have uh, some 40 people in the room. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to encourage all participants to, to ask questions. Uh, do ask from the chat so we can give you the floor and the moment uh, that's easier for, for, for Maria and for, and for me uh, If you just line line up in the chat We'll give you the floor and then you can be on camera and ask your question but Because we are really many people and you know, I will stay <laughs> as much as possible asking questions because I, I, I also had, uh, many uh, Let's try to be effective and to the point so that uh, we can uh, use uh, Andrea's time in, in the best possible way. Okay, are there any questions? People are shy in the beginning. Someone needs to break the ice, yeah. Um, well, I guess that should be me then. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I was very, uh, very, I'm very thankful and, uh, and certainly agree with your um, uh, idea about foresight in a way as uh, one, so, you know, the whole idea of uh, low lags te uh, behind technology is uh, very much a social construct that we have accepted in the recent decades and not necessarily something that has been always the case or it necessarily has to be the case. So um, now how far do you go in, in that regard? Uh, you know, so it's some, so you still do accept a lot of what is happening out there um, as part of what, you know, what needs to happen. And then, you know, that the foresight really kind of is, yeah. 
well, you know, I, I could imagine there being even more foresight. So uh, in the sense that much of the technology that is being developed could also be developed much more on the outcome basis, you know, so we have a mission to, to do sustainable growth. That means that we do not produce technologies uh, that uh, will likely detract from those, but instead actually direct all our resources to producing technology that will contribute. So I think that the foresight can go much further. And uh, why do you remain so, uh, uh, so moderate? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maria. No, I, I think I, I, yeah, I've been pretty, pretty humble in terms of uh, bringing in foresight because I know that it is a bit complicated for uh, for a policymaker to digest. And I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm all for uh, embedding outcomes. And for me, the sustainable development goals are the more. Uh, I mean, it could be improved, of course, but they are the most complete set of. Uh, outcomes and balanced set of outcomes that we have today. The, the European Commission is working, although a little bit um, uh, silently, on possible ways to reorient the better regulation agenda towards uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, but it's true that we don't have the same uh, narrative or even theoretical approach when we do policies for technology. So. Um, the, that's why I was very critical of the Commission when they started talking about competitiveness in AI, because in my opinion, that's not the issue. I mean, um, a, a lot of investment in AI goes into things that, have, that do nothing for the sustainability of the, or the resilience, now key buzzword, if you wish, of, the, of, of our society. I mean, um, a lot of money goes into, I don't know, Huawei phones or, or other phones that enable you to, um, to snap a better selfie or uh, into Netflix's uh, huge investments to improve its recommendation engine that accounts for 70% of their revenues. And, um, uh, and, and increasing, of course, even more now that we are all couch potatoes, uh, or many of us, in particular, the countries in lockdown have had an, a, an increasing amount of couch potatoes. So how do we do this? In my opinion, it's very important that um, uh, technology is considered as a means to an end, and thereby uh, policy becomes more, if you wish, uh, uh, mission-driven uh, in this respect. Um, there is, of course, a huge uh, um, debate there, inclu including in law and economics. I mean, whether policy should be open-endedly looking for increases in social welfare, for example, or more, um, uh, say, uh, specifically looking for uh, multi-criteria analysis of the outcomes that we want to realize um, by 2030 and beyond. And that is uh, where I think I would nest this discussion. Technology is only one of those ingredients for me. I mean, the discussion is broader. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, uh, Hans uh, Klopp and Jorit as well. uh, in uh, in the line and Jorit. So Jorit first. Joris, please come forward. Welcome. Hi Joris, how are you? <coughs> good, good. How are you, Andrea? Good to see you uh, <coughs> in an online context. So. <coughs> thank you, thank you for giving that paper, and and um, I, I have a. I have a question that it's basically trying to maybe be a little bit taking a little bit like a perspective where democracy is really central democracy and its relation to technology and uh, maybe less um, centered on uh, the technology and, and the innovations around technology so and I, I do think your paper lays that that out very well and, and and I think it also lays it out in a way that 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 I imagine fits pretty well with how the Commission is is looking at this but I think over time and especially the last decade we have seen you know the digital transformation in certain areas really leading to what what I would call a, a, a challenge to democratic governance mm -hmm. and we see that in the social media sphere of course quite clearly with debates about disinformation, but but I would say you could also see it in other areas of you know platform ordering in our society where you you mentioned you know the Uberization and and other forms where you know I think there are many ways they're just very clever uh, and rather aggressive forms of regulatory arbitrage that are um, taking place and and there are still significant pushback. Some of these developments are not accepted you know in our societies. You know it's 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 not clear that the Uber Kind of as a driving kind of the driver part of the uber of uber is really the transport part is really going to survive in the way that they would like it to know and uh, so i i see that you know like 
maybe even more than you know like we have the internet and the internet caused so much transformation and now you know like we have these platforms doing such significant you know reorganization of value chains in different spheres of activity that democratic um, governance over those spheres of social and economic life are, are quite uh, uh, fundamentally challenged and, and i have a sense that in politics that is also you know informing the way you know that you know like their calls for sovereignty and you know they're in, in many different areas you see you know it's like hey maybe not the techno regulation kind of thing but you have to reassert you know the democratic kind of imperative and law is a really good instrument uh, to do that so I, I i just want to ask you if you if you if you recognize that as well this kind of you know like that there is there is in a way uh, a lot of push to 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 reaffirm democratic values over maybe you know particular kind of trajectories of uh, of technology innovation thank you Thank you, Joris. Uh, I'll try to be brief. It's a huge uh, potentially topic, um, but I think you're right. I mean, we see this trend um, and we see also the fact that a technological means, you know, technology is always, we, we always say, is just uh, as good as the people that use it and, and the use that is made of it, right? So we see something born in the most democratic possible way, in a, a decentralized ar architecture with uh, with end-to-end -end, uh, communication, with no possibility to actually even inspect the, the traffic flows, uh, becoming something that uh, uh, um, you know people describe as an alternative between um, uh, um, the social credit scoring of China and the surveillance capitalism in the U.S. So something that is way more centralized uh, uh, and uh, and and much less open uh, than uh, that, that we we uh, we expected. So my my contribution here is uh, to to reassure that that's not the end, meaning that there is something, but that could be done to restore decentralized architectures, um, and that this might potentially end up becoming more sustainable at once and democratic because it uh, reduces the centralization of information in the hands of, uh, of, of a fistful of companies. Now, that said, it, that's not easy. I mean, what, what I see, also linking it to the question on foresight that Maria asked, him, asked me, technology has now gotten to the level where we can imagine more decentralized and distributed architectures in, uh, uh, in cases in which previously it was impossible. It was uh, inefficient. It was costly. And uh, I think in this case, both starting with the, the organization of the markets and then moving into, in general, the organization of data governance, for example, uh, we have the possibility of imagining cases in which uh, uh, data and, uh, and market power become more fragmented, much more fragmented. And this, all this paper, and I think also the presentation that I, I think the last time I saw you, Yoris, we were in the, in the conference that then gave uh, rise to this paper and maybe a paper of your own, I guess. Um, uh, starts from a reflection that I made a while ago when I was asked about the future of the single market and I looked at the technology as it was evol evolving and I thought why do we why are we looking for Alstom Siemens I mean uh, why are we looking for building European champions um, in digital technology we could easily have uh, interoperable administrations open uh, platforms and APIs and the single market would be made of a myriad of small companies that would provide services on the basis of a shared information pool. So that said, um, this leads to a completely different type of market organization. Are we able to do that or not? I think that uh, there are a number of things that need to be, that need to be done. Um, and uh, depending on the, on, the, um, on the goal that we have, we, we have now the possibility of juggling a lot more with governance uh, forms. Than in the past. One example, I don't want to take too long on this, one key example is the, uh, for example, the battle over uh, contact tracing applications on COVID-19. We have a situation in which most governments want to have a centralized system because they want the information about who has been in the proximity of someone who then tested negatively. And we have a, a community of researchers and now, unbelievably, even the tech giants, uh, defending the decentralized architecture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, governments. Um, it's a sort of a clash of cultures where, um, and, and if you wish, an occasional alignment of interests between the end users and the tech giants, because uh, um, uh, you know, 
keeping the con control of the data in the hands of the end users is considered to be uh, the only way in which uh, at least some of the end users would accept a partial derogation from the otherwise uh, um, um, uh, untouchable uh, principle of uh, user control over data. Uh, it's a very complicated issue, but I think we will see those uh, battles between decentralized, distributed, and, and centralized governance forms much more in the future. It becomes also a way for the EU to create a sustainable alternative to the models that we see in China and the US. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first, Hans Klok, uh, please come forward. Uh, you, you have a, a complex I question that I would like. I've landed a little bit on Anz's question, so yeah. uh, maybe I can take it directly. Um, um, well, we are, I, maybe I can add something to this. I already, to some extent, said something about this, also in answering uh, Yoris. We are in a very strange situation today, in particular on the side of artificial intelligence, but more generally. Yeah? We have this um, emerging rivalry between the US and China that is, um, it's not just a rivalry, it's, uh, it is evolved on the side of the US into an obsession. I've been in conferences uh, uh, with uh, um, academics and think tanks from the US. When you ask them what's the key priority of the US in digital technology, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the answer never changes. The first answer is always China. Now, we are in a situation that is a bit strange. We have in the, in the digital ecosystem that I've shown, um, the US have realized that they have completely missed the train of uh, edge uh, and uh, sort of Internet of Things uh, layers of the ecosystem. They don't have the technology simply. They don't have the 5G patents. They don't have uh, uh, enough Internet of Things technologies. So they're very weak on this really fast emerging part of the market. The EU is stronger than the US. If you think, for if you look at the patents for 5G, for example, the EU is not far from China. It's um, it's actually uh, the EU and the EU companies such as Nokia and Ericsson are uh, competing um, quite well in the 5G market, and they are very well represented in the um, uh, standard essential patents for 5G. Uh, now. But the EU doesn't have the platforms, right? Uh, meaning the EU has uh, uh, not developed this first wave of the internet that now leads, uh, makes the US so powerful in the cloud part. So um, then you look at China, and China is almost self-sufficient, meaning China is almost all the technologies in that stack, which means China can go also everywhere around the world, 130 countries, and offering a full bundle of the digital Silk Road uh, as being a set of things similar to the technology stack that I was showing before for the single market. Show, um, bringing in the Huawei infrastructure, the other um, uh, you know, physical layer, bringing, bringing in their own platforms, their own appli application, their own standards, their own code uh, representing uh, basically their own legal rules. So exporting a full ecosystem. Now, this leads the EU and the US in a situation in which they are almost inevitably natural allies. Meaning, um, you might have read on the news a few weeks ago that, they, that in the US there was the intention to invest in Nokia. Um, there is a lot of attention for our players on the infrastructure and uh, Internet of Things space, the Siemens, the SAPs, uh, the Bosch and the others. And, uh, and this is creating a situation in which you should expect a lot of transatlantic cooperation, despite the differences in the administration, because there is a, a, key, a key alignment of interests between the EU and the US as an alternative to the rise of China. So this is how I see the situation, uh, uh, the situation in this field. And um, big, small tech firms, banks, and other governments, I mean, I might tackle this part of the question in 30 seconds. I try, Alessio, sorry. Um, with, uh, with uh, a butad, if you wish, something, a provocation that I've um, uh, launched a, a while ago that is based on a similar reflection to those on, on the single market. Every time I go to a conference, every time I go to a conference and there is someone uh, uh, from the European Commission and, and it's about digital technologies, the first sentence is standard by default. Europe does not have any of the top 20 tech giants in the world, okay? And then if you reflect on the, on the fact that we do have a competition policy that inevitably uh, prioritizes uh, pluralism in the market, let's say more fragmented in the positive sense market structures at any given moment in time, that we have um, a GDPR that contains a data minimization principle, 
and that we have largely demonized, and, and in most cases, rightly so, some of the behaviors of the platforms, then I think if you were really consistent, I would say Europe should start celebrating the fact that it has none of the top 20 tech giants in the world. Because when you have a top tech giant in the world, this is dangerous for democracy, for the polarization of market power, for the future of workers, and for sustainability. So that's, I leave it as a provocation again. But, uh, um, and move maybe to Joao, because uh, I know that we are running out of time. Yeah. Yes, Joao, please come forward. Joao, are you still there? Sorry, a listener? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, okay. Hi. So it's very quick. Uh, I, I think it, it's even a follow up from the last sentence of um, Sad. So Europe does not have this company, but these companies do influence European politics a lot. So in which way it's not, so it's not Europe's sovereignty affected by not having these companies? Because in a way, we do, so the countries are not benefiting from the, having these big giants, but at the same time, democratic systems are being affected and we see damage analytics, et cetera. So my question goes to the extent to which are, is there a need for a treaty revision that does include digital policy as a competence of the EU? So we've seen during the Juncker Commission a lot of the um, initiatives that were literally just uh, beginning to think about sovereignty, but no treaty revision is even being talked about. So how can the EU do this foresight of policy if in these legal treaties does not have responsibility to do so? And even so in an area that's so horizontal to any policy area, would you say that digital policy will be the driver for further European integration in a way? Or do you see that the EU is still manageable to do these kind of changes without a treaty revision? I do believe that contrary to what happens, for example, in healthcare, um, the, uh, the EU has all the competences uh, it needs in order to um, at least approach the issue of technological sovereignty. Um, it might be doing this in a slightly, uh, let's say, unorthodox way uh, through maybe large public-private partnerships, uh, large missions as it's doing with its research and innovation policy. Uh, but it mostly will do this in a way that it's already started to, started to do um, um, through extraterritorial rules, I'll read GDPR. And it would be extremely interesting to see how the, the Commission will approach the revision of GDPR, which now has to become much more code related then because it's it's a new generation type of uh, uh of legislation that would need to embed if you wish compliance and enforcement already in the in the design yeah. um but also the extraterritorial rules are something that is there are there has been considered in the ai space in the future regulatory initiative uh, i think that that part uh, will uh, uh, be further fo fostered by the data strategy where you, we have basically the um, very assertive introduction of so-called data spaces, the governance of which is still unknown, but it largely are a way to do two things, which is rebalancing uh, the value generated by uh, uh, digital value chains uh, to bring it back in the hands of the ones that originally generate the value, in particular real economy companies, the automotive companies, the energy companies, and so on but even the farmers, if you wish. Uh, and at the same time, repatriating data and value, meaning that uh, uh, the data spaces would most likely come with the enhanced attention for uh, storing data uh, on the territory of the EU. And, uh, and that is uh, you know, part of the answer to Joao. There's another thing which he said, and that is uh, extremely meaningful, which is when it comes to public opinion, when it comes to content, when it comes to ordering, when it comes to ranking and offering content to the end users, there are countless ways in which the current platforms in the B2C services can hyper nudge end users. So they have a big control over the shaping of the public opinion. You can only imagine, you see, even in the US, the big um, um, debates between Twitter and, uh, uh, and Facebook as to what is the role of the platform in, uh, in shaping and accompanying public, the public debate. Uh, in Europe, this will take a specific form, which is the revision of the Digital Services Act, uh, and, uh, the, um, and perhaps something more than that, uh, and the establishment of something that is exactly the opposite of where we started from, 
in the, um, in the uh, uh, regulation of or non-regulation of the internet, meaning the idea that intermediaries should never be responsible for what happens uh, on their servers and pipelines is an idea uh, that is largely outdated today. And we end up with a situation in which, as I was saying before, platforms are a very hybrid form of governance in the market that is not responsible currently for the huge economy uh, the platforms move. Think about Amazon, uh, they are not really responsible for the, the, the sustainability and the practices of the vendors that go through Amazon, shielded behind the neutrality and the mere conduit provisions in the e-commerce directive. And this will certainly change in the revision of the e-commerce directive, the Digital Services Act, in a way that will create a much bigger space of responsibility. And so editorial and, and responsibility and corporate responsibility for the platforms. And I think this will be change in the way in which we approach the relationship between the digital uh, digital economy and the rest of society. All right, uh, so we actually reached uh, the, the limit uh, of this seminar, but I propose, as I already agreed with Maria and Andrea, we will stay on for 15 more minutes and whoever wants to ask uh, other questions, welcome to do so. This is extremely exciting. We have two people lined up already in the chat. But now I will abuse my role as one of, as co-chair and ask one of my many questions to, to Andrea. And that, the, 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 the second most touching thing you said during your presentation was uh, the mention of the fear of the firm and Coase and Williamson, who passed away two weeks ago. Uh, the first one was when you said that we are we are aging together. But this is our, these are related things. Uh, the role of the law. Is crucial in this, in the in, in in the tension between market and hierarchies, at least as we knew it, right? So contracts are incomplete, and the law plays a fundamental role in completing that. Now this all sounds very theoretical, but I'm sure you understand what I'm what you know what, what I'm heading to. Uh, can you give us a couple of examples in which the law? kind of misses its natural ability to complete contracts uh, in this setting because of platformization. Yeah, I mean, the key, the, an easy example is the, um, is the transformation of contractual relations on uh, sort of gig economy workers, if you wish. Meaning we have a law that has created a specific space for employment relationships and thereby uh, tilts the balance inevitably between forms of governance, right? From spot transactions or uh, uh, relational contracts, as Williamson would have called them, uh, uh, or uh, hierarchical relations where uh, the rights of the workers are uh, protected, just as also the right of the employer uh, is protected in a, in a, in a different legal uh, setting and arrangement compared to what happens in the market. No, the platforms have um, uh, basically leveraged uh, network effects to create a, a space in which um, employment contracts are transformed into uh, spot contracts, basically that can be terminated at any moment. Um, and um, independent contractors uh, are basically uh, playing the role of employees. Um, they don't have access to things like uh, dialogue, for example, between the, the, the social parties uh, and within the organization of the platform. And they cannot even unionize because the law, in particular competition law, is very skeptical of the possibility of independent firms, however small, to uh, jointly negotiate. It's a sort of a cartel provision. So there's, there's quite a lot of debate as to whether uh, competition law is actually preventing from you know, the, the unionization of gig, gig economy workers. So that is a case in which a disruptive uh, form of governance enabled by technology creates a, a hiatus in the, in the law that uh, we need somehow to, to reconfigure many and for the law to really uh, continue to, to uh, play that, uh, um, uh, that role of uh, uh, accompanying parties in the, in the design of their, of their transactions and their interactions. Um, to me, again, platforms are a good example because Indeed, I quote oh, really the, the taxonomy of um, 
uh, say classical and neoclassical and relational contracts that Williamson has um, taken from uh, uh, previous literature but further developed um, um, in the 70s as, as a good example because in none of these relational contracts or classical contracting you can see the platform mode being clearly represented. So that is certainly one thing. The other thing is um, um, the cases in which the plat platformization determines the um, basically the fortune and the and the and and the uh, uh, also uh, curse of the uh, of firms without there being a contractual relationship between them. So, for example, the European Commission has created and and now uh, finally. Uh, the EU has um, implemented a very innovative piece of legislation that is the platform to business regulation. And that applies to cases in which you have a commercial relationship um, between, uh, I don't know, Amazon and a given vendor. But the problem is, how do you make, should you make this applicable also to, uh, I don't know, a search engine that without having any contractual relationship shapes reality on the internet in a way that um, offers specific products over others and that is also a gap because the legislation doesn't cover that and um, and uh, the platform to business regulation in principle applies but there, there are countless lawyers around Europe that are trying to you know, bump their head on the wall to understand how is that possible and how that fits, fits the legal category so just a couple of examples I think we could go on forever and then uh, maybe maybe we should actually uh, and you know engage in that exercise Thank you very much. We have at least Maria and Anz lined up. Uh, will you please ask a question, two in a row, so that uh, Andrea can, can, can answer and close the seminar? Okay, so Andrea. I have a, I, I'll do it quickly. So, uh, first of all, what do you think about private enforcement as a way forward to actually um, regulate many of those tech stuff? So both in terms of social media uh, um, and, uh, but also much, much further than that. So uh, this is one question. Another question is, okay, so on the one hand you say Europe is really interested to kind of more, with more foresight now uh, eventually regulate technology, but what they are doing in another field, uh, which is ex directly related to sustainability is basically to replace a uh, precautionary principle or at least kind of little bit we are weaken it by introducing something called innovation principle so you have written this very good study on regulation and innovation uh and which is now used by the commission also to show well you know it's not the regulatory it's you know it's mainly uh like look at what renda has said um and uh, uh and but at the same time you know it is a privatization of decision making about what kind of technologies we will have in the field uh, often related to issues of, of sustainability to the pri uh, to the hands of private actors of all kinds, you know, not just tech industry. So these two things, quick, effective. I'll try to be quick because uh, these are two very interesting questions. Well, I um, private enforcement, I think, remains a, a very important means of uh, enforcing individuals individual rights. But I don't trust private enforcement by itself as a means of solving those controversies because of the what we call the pacing problem because of the of the that's the first uh, uh, reason because of the of the fact that in these markets for more than two tech decades and me as a as a scholar also in competition law I've seen this happening countless times we've seen a reproposition of cases in which four companies is systematically uh, more um, uh, let's say attractive to violate the law and then settle uh, with those that might have an incentive to sue uh, rather than uh, behave in the first place. So that's why um, the use of code and support of the law rather than the other way around, so that the paying lip service to code because this is where the law shouldn't venture. Uh, so the use of code and support of the law, in my opinion, is the next generation. A lot of this should be solved by design ex ante and then leave space, of course, for complementary exposed um, private enforcement. That's very briefly. There's, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a book, maybe we should write it. On the precautionary principle, yes, it's been very complicated because uh, I have written about the relationship between regulation and innovation for a long time. But then mm, this topic has been hijacked by a bunch of CEOs of uh, large corporations in Europe that were using the innovation principle as a means to um, uh, sort of get rid of the precautionary principle. 
first, uh, regulation and innovation go hand in hand um, and actually uh, well-designed, well-timed, adequately stringent regulation is in most cases a precondition for giving innovation the directionality that you and I were talking about before on outcomes-based regulation. So I would actually replace the, the, uh, the debate between precaution and innovation with a debate about what is the degree of precaution that leads us towards specific outcomes. Because if you only look at economic efficiency in the neoclassical sense, in most cases you end up um, um, uh, maybe uh, erring on the side of a lack of precaution. But if you take a, a subjective well-being, sustainability dimension, in most cases, and, and also the risk aversion of people, if you wish, you end up in a different uh, equilibrium zone. Uh, you see this today with the coronavirus, COVID-19. The Netherlands has not had a lockdown. We see this today in Belgium, in Italy, in many other countries. The pressure to reopen the economy is completely different if you put it in the hands of a, of a mainstream economist compared to putting it in the hands of, uh, of a lawyer or a social, another social scientist. I mean, uh, we look at the papers from Greenstone, for example, and the, the University of Chicago on um, the value of a statistical life and when to reopen the economy. Uh, it's very complicated to, to, to explain this to, um, to a layperson that um, you have to reopen because uh, giving that monetary value to human lives, uh, meaning perhaps uh, factories uh, at some point become more important. So I would actually uh, frame this within the outcome-based, uh, um, principle-based, outcome-based regulation uh, debate. Yes, Hans Klopp waiting, just a little note because there's a project at Chicago against this approach and I've written against as well. So not all economists are not no, no, I know, evil, I know. Right. evil as that. Not all Chicago, not even the ones that have been in Chicago gloriously like Alessio. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hans, please. Yeah, Last so, so, so one of the things, so final thing, I mean, you see some sort of open source and open development type of approach also with the uh, contract tracing apps or notification apps. So, but how can you protect these types of things if, if we have a lot of them in Europe from big companies, you know, just spotting them and then stealing the whole thing? Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting question because I think we have gone beyond the open source uh, debate, meaning... Uh, the tech giants uh, champion the open source development uh, whenever it's not about one of their core technologies, of course, uh, because this is something that maximizes diffusion, right? And uh, researchers and end users that are tech savvy also privilege the open source approach for transparency reasons. Now, that said, you can put a very, in, a very intransparent way of managing the data on top of an open source software, a very insecure way of storing the data on top of an open source software. So I think we have to look at the full stack again uh, and see, uh, in particular, what is the data governance uh, provision. You can easily use um, open source software and have a centralized uh, um, storage of data. Uh, and having it secure, um, of course, you need to trust that wherever data are, are placed, they will not be accessed. And uh, you cannot just trust governments that will say that they will keep the data for a specific uh, uh, amount of time, because this is basically, uh, I mean, one of the silliest statements you can make with something that is easily reproduced at zero marginal cost like this data. I mean, you can make countless copies of this, and then you could claim that it's been destroyed. But I mean, it's, I don't see how that can be the basis for it. A fruitful debate and this is for those possibilities this is why the debate has moved into data should never leave the device and when i say about the occasional alignment of interest is that obviously apple and google are also in favor of data never leaving the device not because they they are favoring the uh the user control over data at all in all cases but because the device is where they are and um, if, the, if the data are on the device, maybe they can do something with it if they are the champions of the operating system. So we are seeing in Europe a, a battle that, in my opinion, has several different hidden agendas in there. And it is surprisingly similar and almost ironically similar to the battle that we saw in the U.S. During the, after the San Bernardino um, attacks, where the, the iPhone of the killer uh, contained potentially sensitive information and in a way that in my opinion was largely fake because it was done for commercial purposes, but Apple stood against the US government by saying, uh, not even the government can uh, hack our phones because we, we are on the side of the end users. So um, the open source part I think will become increasingly mainstream and we'll be increasingly discussing where the data go and how do we protect them. 
thank you very much, Andrea. I think we have used abused uh, much of your time, but this was like very exciting, super exciting, and uh, we talked forty five uh, participants in this seminar, and we cannot stop questioning you, but we should in the interest of your time. Thanks again for joining us in this event. Uh, we hope to see you in person and to see all of you in person very much, very soon. And without further ado, now I stop the recording and thank